I kind of have like a bonus question because like, this is something that I've been thinking for a while. Do you believe in uh, self-insuring? By this, I mean having enough money to not need life insurance. Okay. Do you believe in that? I don't. And the reason why I say it is why should you use your own money where you can pay 20, 25, a hundred dollars a month to get a hundred thousand dollars of life insurance but you're using your own money so i don't believe in self-insurance disclaimer the insights and opinions shared on this show are for educational and entertainment purposes only before making any financial decisions we recommend consulting with a qualified professional to better understand your unique financial situation welcome to the investors playbook show where our mission is clear empowerment through financial education we firmly believe that financial freedom isn't a privilege. It's a right that's available to everybody. Each week, we dive deep into the world of finances, breaking down complex topics and making them accessible and actionable for everyone. As we grow this community, we invite you to join us on this journey. Why tune in? Because together, we're not just learning about wealth. We're building a movement, reshaping futures, and proving that with the right knowledge, Financial success is within everyone's reach. It's time to get off the sidelines. Let's go. Yes, yes. Welcome to another episode of Investor's Playbook, episode 41. I'm Deshaun Edwards. And I'm Cornell Rowan. And today we have a special guest. We have Miss Cheryl. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I actually met her on LinkedIn. Uh, she was talking to me about life insurance and, you know, it's a very important uh, topic and she just seemed really knowledgeable. So I just had to ask her to come on to our podcast and, and share this knowledge with our audience. Ms. Cheryl, can you please tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yes. Um, thank you so much for having me, um, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Cheryl Blakeney. Actually, I live in Orlando, Florida. And my corporate job is I'm, I'm an accountant. I've been doing accounting for four decades. I love my numbers. Uh, seven years ago, I actually stepped into the financial service arena. So I am a licensed insurance broker. I'm actually licensed in 15 states. So my goal is to educate people when it comes to life insurance, the importance of having life insurance. Um, so that's a little bit about me, guys. Okay. Thank you. So I guess we'll dive right in. Um I guess I'll start by asking you, what are the key factors that individuals should consider when selecting, you know, a life insurance policy? Because nor normal times, people don't really know where to go. Uh, it's not really a topic that's, that's widely talked about amongst people. So, yeah, what should people consider? So, um, it's a few key factors. First, you want to talk about coverage amount, and that's what amount of life insurance do you need? And each person is different. Each family is different. So that's one of the things we talk about. Second thing we talk about is what type of policy. We have permanent policies and we have term policies, or we call them temporary policies because it's for a set number of years. So those are two key factors. The other factor is premium. How much do you want to pay for your life insurance? Each person is different. Some people want to pay more based on accumulating cash value. Some people want to pay less which will be a term policy. And one of the last factor is how long the duration of the coverage is going to be. Do you want a set number of years or do you want it whole life? Do you want it for the rest of your life? So those are four key factors that you really need to consider when we talk about life insurance. Man, so that was always one of the things that I wanted to better understand. Um, and I'll double down on that question, right? I know that everyone's situation will be different um, when it comes to how much life, well, per se, how much life insurance they need, what their key factors are, their age, um, their actual health status, what their intention is for actually using the life insurance. But I guess what I really want to know is what is considered too much coverage or not enough coverage or, and does that differ between the different forms of life insurance, like term life, whole life, the ones you mentioned, um, basically, like, how does someone determine how much life insurance they need? Okay. Right. In the financial arena, it is a formula, and we call it the DIME, D-I-M-E. And what that means is D stands for your debt. So you calculate your debt, your mortgage, your rent, I mean, your mortgage, your car payment, your credit card. That's the D. 
I is for income. Basically, we said you want to you want to take ten times your income for them, you know, for the money that you're leaving your family. So if you make fifty thousand dollars a year, you want to multiply that time ten. So that's five hundred thousand dollars. Okay. M stands for mortgage. If you have a mortgage, you want to calculate the balance of your mortgage. And then E stands for education. If you have children or you, you know, you want if you want to have children and they're going to go to college, you want to calculate that as well. So the dime formula actually calculates how much insurance you should need. Now, based on that calculation, part of that can be term, part of that can be whole life. Because if you're talking a million dollars in whole life insurance or universal life, that's a whole lot of money. But you could actually divide it, maybe five hundred thousand dollars in term, five hundred thousand dollars in you know in a permanent insurance. But at least you have enough to cover both. So that's how you ask. That's how we determine how much a person needs for life insurance. All right, I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. And if they don't mm -hmm. have mortgage, they just ignore the M. Correct. Right. They just Correct. go with. If they don't have children, they ignore. They ignore the E. Okay. Yep. But that's you know, okay. matter. if they're a family, they you know, and they have a and they're a homeowner, they take in the whole consideration of the dime formula. When you said ignore the mortgage, I just put the it, it said die. I was like, yo, that's crazy. No, no. So, but I, yeah, going to the next one. No, well, all right. When I say, so number three. Yeah, when I say mortgage, meaning mortgage would be zero for your calculation. You would keep the dime. It would just be M1 equals zero. Correct. <laughs> I, saw, okay. I saw your face, Cornell. I was like, I, no, bro. No. Just <laughs> no. I, <laughs> I was trying to shake my head. No. So but it's all good. Because I like I, when I uh, removed the M, I thought the same thing. We talking about life insurance. I'm like, man. No. So <laughs> Yeah, but no, that's, I really like that formula because, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, so formulas make sense to me, right? And being able to calculate how much life insurance you need just by debt, income, mortgage, education, mm -hmm. I mean, it it lays it out pretty simple. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I like the, I like the formula like for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I know that you mentioned that you can have a mixture of, of life, uh, life insurance. Mm -hmm. Like when it comes to term, whole, and I know that there's another one called universal. Mm -hmm. Do you mind telling us the difference between these uh, life insurance policies? Yes, I will. So term life insurance is the least expensive, but you get more health coverage. However, it has a specified set number of years. It can be anywhere from 10, 20, 30 years. So the coverage, you have a lot more coverage. The premium is going to be a lot less than whole life. OK, so you have more coverage, you're paying less money. Now, the thing about a term policy, because it's a set number of years, that person really needs to, in order for that policy to get paid out, the person needs to pass away within that term period. Otherwise, the policy does not get paid out. So if a person lives, if a policy is for 30 years, they live that day after that 30th year, the beneficiaries gets nothing paid out. OK, so that's the importance of knowing what a term policy is. Now, also with a term policy, you have you don't accumulate any cash values. And the reason why is because the premium is so low, you're getting so much insurance, but you're you're getting it for a set number of years. So it does not accumulate cash values. So some of the people that's suitable um, for this. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh you're saying it does not accumulate cash value. Can you just explain what uh, cash value yeah. is? I, I apologize. Okay. So basically, when we have a term policy and a um, permanent policy, cash values, we can consider it like a little savings account or a savings bucket within your life insurance policy. So when you pay for life insurance, you have a cost of insurance. Say your insurance is $100,000. A portion of that is going to your cost of insurance. So if you was to pass away, that amount is actually paying for your life insurance. The other portion is going to your cash values, which is considered like a savings account. So that money accumulates over the years. So when we talk about cash value, it's the money that's accumulating in your life insurance policy over the years that you have the actual life insurance policy. So because term, you have, you're paying less money 
for more insurance. It does not accumulate a saving account or cash values. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Well, whole life and both does universal life also give you cash value or is it just whole life? They both do. So back to term. So people that most people that use term, they use it for mortgage insurance. Like if you have a 30 year mortgage, you get a 30 year term policy. And then you and the whole, you know, you and your spouse of your single, um, um, a single individual, you take that, you pay your monthly premiums. It can be anywhere from $25, $30 for 30 years. If something was to happen to you, you now have $200,000, $300,000 of life insurance that can pay off your mortgage. So this is one way that you can use a term policy because it's for a set number of years and your mortgage is for a set number of years. Okay. Now, when we talk about whole life, whole life was the first policy insurance that actually came out back in 19, 19, 1973. So what happened was people wanted something permanent for the rest of their life. People are living longer. When they did the mortality rate back in the 1970s, 1960s, I'm sorry, the mortality rate back then was age 75 years old. They didn't expect people to live past age 75. So that's why whole life was so expensive. Now, because people are living longer, it now goes to 120 years old, permanent whole life insurance. That's a long time. So basically your coverage is for the rest of your life. Your premiums are going to be a lot higher than a term policy. However, you are accumulating cash values, like a little savings bucket within your policy. And the whole life has, they have a guaranteed interest rate that you're going to, that you're going to accumulate over the years. It can be anywhere from one to 2% over the years that you have your policy. That's a whole life policy. Universal life, people wanted something where they wanted their interest rate to be a little bit more higher than just 1% to 2%. So uh, um, when it comes to a universal life, it's the coverage is, you know, whatever the coverage is for that amount, your premium, we have flexible premium. Whole life policy, if you don't pay your premium within 30 days, your policy can get canceled. Universal life, they have flexible premium. So they have a minimum and they have a maximum. So based on that, that gave people a little bit more leeway when it came to paying their premium. Like if they lost their job, they their premium would be adjusted based on if they accumulated enough money in their cash values. So what would happen, what what would happen is the money that they accumulated in their cash values, they just pulled that from their life insurance policy. And that means for maybe a year or six months, they don't have to pay anything, but that policy is still intact. Okay. Now, when it comes to the cash values of a universal life, it is a, it participates indirectly in the stock market. So what happens is we have what we call a cap and a floor. So as the stock market goes up, your interest rate and your universal life policy can go up to a cap. These policies most of the time cap out at anywhere between 10 and 12%. So if the stock market goes up 15%, they're going to cap out at, you know, 10 to 12%. However, it has what we call a floor. So if the stock market goes below 0%, the interest that they actually accumulated, which is their cash values, will never, they will never lose that. It's locked in. It's guaranteed they will never lose that. They will never lose that amount. So this is what we call a universal life. You have the flexibility of your premium. And you also have, when it comes to your death benefit, we have a level death benefit. Say your policy is $100,000 or you have an increasing death benefit. And what that means is if a person passed away and they accumulated, say, $200,000 in their cash values, they never got a chance to use it because you can use it. You can, you, you know, you can do a withdrawal from your cash values. They never got a chance to use it. What will happen is that money now rolls over to the beneficiary. So your policy was $100,000. You accumulated $200,000 you never got to use. Now, guess what? Your beneficiary now has $300,000 as far as your life insurance. So this is what the wealthy use to create generational wealth because we have those increasing death benefits 
where that money will accumulate if they never got a chance to use their death, um, death benefit. And I hope that was able to so, tell the difference. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. yes, ma'am. Yeah, that, that would, yeah I, I love the explanation. It was very thorough. I really appreciate that. Um, I was going to ask, you said that you could draw from uh, the, the cash. Is this, I know that there's a term that's been viral. Uh, mm -hmm. They're talking about like infinite banking. Is this, is that what this is? Kind of like borrowing from yourself No. Uh, when it comes to your policy? No, infinite banking. So they're all on the concept of life insurance. We have IUL, we have infinite banking, and we have premium financing, but they're all on the um, content of life insurance. So when it comes to IUL, you're actually credited interest through your cash values. Infinite banking, you actually get paid a dividend from your life insurance policy, which is a little difference. So one, you're accumulating cash values where you can actually get credited interest to your savings account. The other one, every year, you're going to get paid dividend based on how much your policy has accumulated over the years. So when you see these um, YouTube and Instagram and TikTok, you know, they tell you, but unless they actually went to school, got a degree, I mean, got a license to, to know what exactly it is, sometimes, you know, people is under the false pretense that everybody qualifies. Everybody doesn't qualify for IUL. Everyone don't qualify infinite banking because you don't get life insurance based on your money. You get life insurance based on your health. Right. So, so infinite banking is its own policy. It's actually a policy that you can sign up for. Correct. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got you. I don't know why I thought that it was an exploit that people were doing. I, they made it sound like it was like, it was a secret. <laughs> yeah. Like a, it was like a life hack. That, Joe, that that Joe broke the system. Yeah. It did sound like, it. cause I mean, even the term infinite banking just sounds like, why isn't everyone doing this? Right. If it's infinite banking, does infinite banking mean infinite money? You know what I mean? It's, right. And the thing about it, that's that, the thing yeah. about, you know, when people talk about infinite banking concept, you need to understand what exactly that means. So infinite banking, yes, you can accumulate quite a bit of money based on you can put in a lump sum, $50,000, $100,000. However, it doesn't matter how much money you put in. If you don't, you qualify based on your health. So if you're not in good health, it doesn't matter if you have $100,000, $200,000 to put into the infinite banking um, life insurance policy. You won't qualify. So this is the misconception that people have. Everyone qualifies for infinite banking, and everyone does not. Everyone does not qualify for IUL. Everyone does not qualify premium financing because it's based on your health. Thank you. And I know that you, um, I know that you slightly, uh, touched on, on this question, but I, I feel like there's more to it, but, uh, can you explain to us like what factors influence the price of a premium for these life insurance, uh, policies? Yeah, it's a lot of factors. <laughs> um, so your age, male or female, because male rates are always going to be higher. Your health. If you're on medication, um, if you do any type of high-risk activity, if you're a scuba diver, if you're a pilot, if you do uh, rock climbing, um, your family history, your driving record, if you have a DUI or a DWI, you can get denied life insurance. A lot of people don't know that. And if you have a criminal record, whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony, you can also get life in, you can also get denied life insurance. So it's a lot of factors when it comes to life insurance. A lot. Wow. That's and each of these things, not just even getting denied, but if you do get accepted, it can increase the price. Just like regular insurance, mm -hmm. right? Like car insurance. Mm -hmm. If you have a clean driving record, your car insurance is gonna be lower. You've been in three accidents, you can go through the same car insurance provider, but they see you as a as a liability, as a risk. Right. which means that they're going to be like, All right, we're probably going to have to end up paying this person. So let's increase the amount of money that they're paying us first. Right. And that's kind of how it works. Right. <laughs> and, also, makes sense. and also another big factor is smoker or non-smoker. Because when you're a smoker, mm -hmm. your livelihood of living is a lot shorter than a person that's a non-smoker. So they take all this into consideration mm -hmm. before they actually 
issue your life insurance policy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the the male versus female thing threw me off. Are do 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 women live longer? They do. We do. They do. Mm -hmm. We live longer. <laughs> yes, we do. It's a, actually it's a um it's the mortality rate that determines women live three three or four years longer than men. I think for women it's age like eighty eight, and for men it's like age eighty four. Yes, we live longer. Because we take care of ourselves. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I've seen I've seen men do some pretty dumb things. So I was about I, to I, say, I think I <laughs> men they sometimes do it to themselves, man. <laughs> like not even just acts, but just like lifestyles. You know, mm -hmm. they they live they some can sometimes live risky lifestyles, which mm -hmm. ultimately you know shortens their lifespan so yeah no that make, the numbers make sense yes. um yes. wow so while people are trying to make sure that one they qualify for life insurance and different forms of life insurance mm -hmm. and then also getting a premium that isn't gonna you know gut punch them and mm -hmm. they can actually afford what are some of the mistakes that people make when it comes to purchasing life insurance because mm -hmm. um, like we just talked about a lot of people sometimes go into it with the intention to do infinite banking or the intention to make money um, but yeah just what are some of the common mistakes that people like just make off the bat when it mm -hmm. comes to them purchasing life insurance initially well the first one is underestimating the amount of life insurance that the person should have that's one of the common mm -hmm. mistakes that we that people have Another common mistake is the right policy because one size does not fit all when it comes to life insurance. So you want to make sure that you have the, the right policy in place as well. And then we've had situations where you want to make sure that when you're doing a life insurance policy, you're disclosing the correct information. I had a situation where I had a young guy from my church and he felt I guess he felt embarrassed, so he didn't disclose a certain information, and he was actually denied based on the information. And I tell people, my goal is to help you get the right insurance for you. So if I ask you if you ever had a misdemeanor, if you ever had a DUI, if you ever had, um, you know, anything related, if you if you're on medication, even if you took the medication five years ago, it might not be important to you, but it's important for me to know. So just to make sure that, you know, the common you know, mistake that people have is, well, I don't need to disclose this. Life insurance, you need to disclose everything. If you was on a medication 10 years ago that you went to the doctor and you was having chest pains, you need to disclose it because they're going to find it in your medical records. It's called your MIB and it's going to come up. So I'd rather have the information than to come back to you and say, why didn't you give me this information? Hmm. Well, there you go. That's important. Mm -hmm. So not disclosing everything that they need to disclose when initially signing up and then not getting enough life insurance, basically, which right. kind of leads me to another. Well, are there other uh, mistakes that people make? Those are the common ones. Not having enough the common ones. and definitely not being in the right, not being in the right policy because a policy for you might be a term. A policy for Cornell might be a whole life. A policy for me might be a universal life. So my goal is to research the best insurance for each person based on their factors to obtain life insurance. Gotcha. Uh, and, I, and I feel like, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Cornell. And I was going to say, I, I feel like you kind of answered the, the next question where we talked about, um, we were going to ask you like, how the underwriting process work, like what mm -hmm. factors do they consider? And you really, uh, you already told us that uh, there's a lot of factors, you know, mm -hmm. age, what, what's your gender, mm -hmm. um, health concerns. So uh, you, you were very thorough with your answer and I appreciate that uh, for sure. Um, but I also wanna know like, what role does a beneficiary play um, in life insurance policy? And how can individuals ensure their beneficiary uh, designations are up to date okay. and accurate. 
Okay, your beneficiary is the most important when it comes to your life insurance. And the reason why is that is the person that you're going to leave responsible to make sure that your financial needs when it comes to your life insurance, your burial is taken care of. So you want to think long and hard <laughs> before you just assign anybody to be your beneficiary. Sometimes it's not always a family member. It can be your best friend. But you got to make sure it can be a charitable organization. You got to make you want to make sure that you have the confidence that that person is going to make sure that you get buried. Because when it comes to beneficiaries, you know, you can change it. They're not set in stone. That's the thing about a beneficiary. They're not set in stone. So you can change it at any time. Actually, one of my clients, her beneficiary was her brother. And then like, you know, she called me, she's like, can I change it? So she actually changed it to her sister. But it's based on, you know, the beneficiary that you want. So when it comes to beneficiaries, there's two types. You have a primary and you have a contingent. Your primary beneficiaries is the first, first person that you assign, you know, God forbid something was to happen to you. Most of the time you want to have a contingent in case that person passed away. Like when I have young people, usually their primary beneficiary is their parents, which is understandable. But I said, if you if you outlive your parent, you know, you want to make sure you have a contingent. It can be a, a uncle. It can be a sibling. But if you have a contingent, it can be your children. But if they're contingent, they have to be over the age of 18 if it's your children. Um, but it's really, really important to, you know, to think long and hard before you make that decision who your beneficiary is going to be. Because they're the ones that's going to get that $100,000, that $200,000 policy and make that decision how you're going to be buried. So it is so, so important. Mm. No, that makes sense. And I, we had a, um, a talk with someone who was explaining how people don't update their beneficiary or even have a beneficiary at times. And that is just a huge problem, right? You're talking about life insurance. And once the life insurance kicks in, like you said, mm -hmm. Whenever that time does come, they don't have the person in place or they have the wrong person in place. So uh, I, I think I, I don't I, think that could be said. Enough, right. Yeah. I actually had a situation mm -hmm. where the person they had their policy for a long time. So the beneficiary, the beneficiary had actually passed away before the person, mm. but they never updated the policy. So basically. So how does that work? Yeah, it, go ahead. So basically now they have to go to court to determine because they didn't have a contingent. So basically, so you, you have a person that passed away, the beneficiary passed away. So now they have to determine who that money is going to go to. You actually have to go through the court systems to figure out where that money is going to go. So you are already destroyed. The person passed away. Now you have to figure out who's going to be the person over the money. That's, it's a really sad situation. So as you know, I tell people, we do an annual review when it comes to the life insurance policy. Make sure is it the same beneficiary? Do you want to change the beneficiary? Do you want to update your coverage amount? You can update your coverage amount. Do you want to go from a term to a permanent if you have a term policy? So it's so, so important. Like I said, as financial life insurance broker, I make sure I go to a, do an annual review with all my clients just to make sure did anything change? Did they get married? We have situations people got married and the ex-spouse is still the beneficiary on the policy. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, <laughs> it's really, really important. And by law, that ex-spouse, if the person passed away, that money would go to the ex-spouse. So it's, re it's really, really and important to make sure that you do a yearly review of your beneficiaries. It's crucial. Yeah. No, that makes sense because mm -hmm. I can't even imagine being in that type of situation. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I did want to. I wanted to ask this too. We were talking about um, making sure that you have the correct amount of life insurance, mm -hmm. and it might just be like me having conversations, and the person just happened to say what what their opinion was. But I wanted to know. I have life insurance through my job, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I've heard that that's not enough. Or I should get additional life insurance. Mm -hmm not just having the life insurance from the company I work for. Correct. Is there a reason for me to have additional life insurance outside 
of that. I like two life insurance policies at the same mm -hmm. time. Oh, and yes. why would like, you know, my company does not be enough, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you have life insurance on your job, which is really great, you know, people that have life insurance, because a lot of companies don't even offer life insurance, but you, if you have it on your job, that's great. However, it is a group term life insurance policy. You are not the owner of that policy. Your family is not the owner of that policy. The company is the owner of that policy. You are a certificate, uh, cer certificate of that policy. So... As long as you're on that job, if you pass away on that job, it will get paid out to your family. However, it can take six to nine months to get paid out to your family because they're the owner of the policy. I always recommend a person has, if they have the life insurance of their job, that's great. However, always, always have something outside of your job. I can give you a situation. One of my business partners, aunt, she had life insurance on her job. She was there for 35 years. She had a terminal illness. They, you know, she, they let her go because she did not come back in the time within that Family Medical Leave Act, the FMLA. Nine days after she, after she left, the, after they fired her, she passed away. 35 years on a job. Now she had no life insurance. The family had no life insurance. But she was on a job for 35 years. I always recommend, even if you do a small term policy, have something outside of your job. If you leave that job, you get terminated. That life insurance don't follow you because it's group life insurance. It belongs to the company. I see. So as soon as you get terminated, pretty much you're out. Mm -hmm. And so anything can happen in that time period. Mm -hmm. oh, I got you. Okay. No, that makes sense. I, I, I kind of have like a, a little bonus question um d because like, this is something that i've been thinking for a while do you believe in uh self-insuring self like um by this okay can can you by this me? i mean yes ma'am by this i mean having enough money mm -hmm. to not need life insurance okay do you believe in that i don't and the reason why i say it is why should you use your own money where you can pay twenty, twenty five, a hundred dollars a month to get a hundred thousand dollars of life insurance, but you're using your own money? So I don't believe in self insurance because why not let the insurance company pay the family a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars for your premium, your monthly premium of anywhere from twenty five to a hundred dollars instead of you saving or trying to save a hundred thousand dollars? That money could have been used for something else instead of trying to, you know, instead of for your funeral expenses. So I myself believe it's a lot easier to pay the premium where you can get hundreds of thousands and that money, you know, that policy will get paid out whether you pass the day after you get the policy or 30 years down the line. So I, I guess when you're paying the premium, if you're investing that money, couldn't you still get that hundreds of thousands of dollars? I guess that's what I'm what I'm thinking. I know from my experience, um, mm -hmm. consistent investing does um, grant you that type of return. So, right, which which I understand, if, but if, I'm, just, I'm just saying it's like when you pay your premium to me, it's like free money. You're not using your money. So yeah, you can invest, you know, stocks and things like that, and you know your money can grow, you know, as far as stocks. But why would you want to take your money that you invested versus paying a premium and let the company give you that same hundred thousand dollars? Because all right, so check. I I guess this is okay. all right. So check me out. So that that same premium <laughs> that you're paying, right? It's the same. It's the same amount of money, mm -hmm. right? Instead of putting it into life insurance. In getting it through that vehicle, you're getting your own. Like it's the it's the same thing. You're putting the same amount of money. You see what I'm saying? So but I guess like, also, uh, you got to think about this too. So she said, as soon as you get the life insurance policy, you get access to that. Let's just use a hundred thousand dollars as an example, right? It's not gonna take. I mean, it's gonna take quite a while if you're investing a hundred dollars a month for that money to hit a hundred thousand dollars, right? If you're investing in the stock market. So right. let's just, you know, God forbid 
you start investing your money instead of putting it into a life insurance policy and then six years down the road, you pass away. That hundred dollars right. that you've been investing hasn't reached a hundred thousand compared to, or even let's just say a year, right? So, let's just say a year down the road. Go ahead. So, so what I guess what you're saying is short term life insurance would be better, but long term, I guess, would you rather have, I guess my uh, thought is, would you rather have a hundred thousand dollars in life insurance or a hundred thousand dollars cash? You see what I'm saying? But then you got to talk about, would you rather have a... So short term, uh, it's, it's the, um, just in case something happens before yeah. your money reaches to that. I get it. It's the immediate, right? Because you could buy a policy, what it sounds like, and a week later, mm -hmm. you could, a tree could fall on your car while you're driving down the highway mm -hmm. and you get 100000 if you put a hundred dollars into the stock market and a tree falls in your car when you're driving down the highway, you got a hundred dollars. You know what I mean? Yeah, I have another. I have another scenario. So, like, what if, um, say, say you have fifty thousand, just to throw in a number. Say you have fifty thousand dollars in the bank. No one is relying on your income. You're mm -hmm. single. Do you still no debt? Do you still recommend this person? get life insurance and why i do so for me you have fifty thousand dollars in savings right you have no debt so you're going to take that fifty thousand dollars to pay off your funeral expense whatever the situation is right versus uh yes ma'am taking that same premium for fifty thousand dollars say you passed away three weeks later. So now you have, you still have your $50,000 that you accumulated, but now the life the insurance. Person, someone else has the 50,000. We're talking Correct. about like you pass, say, say you pass away. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you okay. still, no, you say you have 50,000, right? So now you passed yes, away, right? You passed away. Yes. So if you had a life insurance policy, you would still have your 50000 and you have the 50000 that the life insurance is going to give you for your expenses instead of using your $50,000. That's the way I think about it. To me, it's like you're paying a premium for a reason to cover an expense that's not coming from your savings or your accumulation or your investments. Do you understand? I hope that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. No, no, I get it. I get that it. Makes I get sense. That makes sense. Yeah. I definitely understand that. And I think that um, that can be the common misconception, right? Because in my head, I was thinking self-insuring, right? If I have the amount of money that I can use to pay for my um, my funeral expenses, for example, why would I also be paying money to this premium? But at the same time, this is now money that is being taken away from my beneficiary, the people who not really depending on my money, but people who I've designated the money to go to, right? They get less of that because they have to use a chunk of that money to pay for my funeral expenses rather than them taking the life insurance money um, and keeping everything that I have. Correct. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Nice. I'd say it's just All like right. it's just like being a four hundred one k when you know when your company match take that free money. So even though you're paying a premium, mm -hmm. that money is not coming from your investments. The money that you accumulated, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. Say your funeral is twenty thousand. So now the family only has eighty thousand. You have a life insurance policy. The family still has a hundred thousand plus your hundred thousand insurance. So you actually have two hundred thousand. Less twenty thousand, so that's one hundred and eighty thousand. When you think about it like that, say I'm a math person, I'm an accountant, so I do numbers. So when you think about it like that, you're actually accumulating more to pay the monthly premium. I hope that's understandable. Yeah. And no, it's definitely understandable. That's I just re I realize with life insurance, I know that, and I know that I, I don't get me wrong, like I completely respect. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I understand what y'all are saying, and it could definitely be good in most in most cases, I feel like. I know that I have an opposing view to, like, certain things, 
you know, which is okay. You know, everybody doesn't have to think the same way. Right. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I, cause when I see, when I see the premium, I'm thinking money that could be invested and can create greater quality of life. Okay. And I, you know, I don't, yeah, I, and, and see, that's how I think of it, especially when, you know, when I pass away, of course, it's going to be good that the money that I have makes somebody else's life better. But at, at this point, if I, if I'm not having kids, if I don't have kids right now, I'm only adding to someone else's situation. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I feel like sometimes, right, I can take away from right now by paying into a like a um some of these products. I know that term life is a lot cheaper, but in you know certain certain situations, you know, I'm not gonna uh, call out any any anyone, but I've seen where people are paying for term life uh, for two terms. And then they outlive the term. And so all that money that could have been invested, nothing. You see what I'm saying? That is insane to me. It's insane. So I've been paying on this term life for for 60 years. (laughs) You get nothing. Imagine if all that money had been invested in something as simple as the S&P 500. How much money would that have been for 60 years? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, you get what I'm saying? So that that's why my like I understand that that's um if I but even if I die tomorrow, you see what I'm saying? I'm gonna have enough money for them to do my everything else is extra. I feel mm-hmm. like me giving them even more extra is just like they they don't need they'll be straight off of what I have for them now. You see what I'm saying? I'm not taking away from them. So that's how my mind goes. You see what yeah. I'm saying? They're gonna be good. I think you're really just like every the factors matter. Do you have children? Do you have a parent that depends right. on you? Do you have a family member that can right. use the money? Do you have this ill feeling that you might, you know, you might not make it tomorrow? Or if you don't have that much money saved up, see if you don't right. have that much money invested, right. but you want to make sure that your people are taken care of. So I think. Life insurance sounds like something that could be good. And if you're able to do both, like have life insurance here while you're still building this nest egg of investments and still investing in the stock market, that sounds like the, like the twofold just think, and that's the whole idea, right? Like we all pay for insurance in all these other situations. And a lot of times we never use it. Car insurance, we pay hundreds of dollars every month. And there's a chance that we might never get into a car accident and never need to use it house insurance we pay for every year but there's a chance that nothing will ever go wrong so we pay for insurance for things that are tangible like our home or our car why not our life you know what i mean i i know but check me out this is where it gets (laughs) it makes sense because that's for people that cannot afford to pay for somebody else's car when you hit it or when your car gets hit you see what i'm saying i'm saying if you have enough you get what i'm saying and that's where the difference is. If everybody had enough money, we wouldn't need insurance. Oh, yeah. But because the thing about it is, yeah. that's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's why yeah. I, I'm I talking about saying. I'm talking about when people have enough. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? That's that's yeah. what I'm talking about. That's where the difference comes in. Mm-hmm. Because if somebody yeah. hits you nine times ten. Most people don't have a thousand dollars. They're not going to be able to to. They're not going to be able to fix your car. Yeah. But for the people that have enough, like if if I could self insure on cars, I would because I there's not a lot of cars that I'm in, like that I'm in that is just gonna be like. <laughs> but yeah, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, the, yeah. You get what I'm saying? So yeah. that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah. But insurance, like you said, and like we've been saying, it helps for the people who don't have that those large just sums of money in the bank. Right? They can't afford to pay for their own car to get fixed or someone else's car to get fixed. Or if their house burns down, they can't pay for it like that replacement. You know what I mean? They just don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank. So yeah, like I get you, I get you. It's all, it all boils down to, do you have enough money to do what you're saying is self insured? And I think the reality is most people don't. So they have to lean on insurance. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, they have to lean on it, but man, 
<laughs> I feel like most people should have life insurance. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah I just, yeah. I just don't like. I, I'm just not a fan of the blanket statement of everybody should have life insurance because I feel like, I feel like everybody's situation is different, mm-hmm. and I feel like mm-hmm. not everybody has somebody that's dependent on their income, and that that was my only point that I was making. Gotcha. But I, I do feel like majority, probably ninety. Eight percent of the people should have like like I, I feel that way. I get you. Honestly. Just to blanket like everybody. I see. Right. Right. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. I get that. Mm-hmm. I get that. Okay. No. I, I well, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I did want to ask you this too though, Miss Cheryl. So life insurance has been around for a long time, like very long time. But just as technology has changed, right? Like we have mm-hmm. I mean, internet one thing from like the nineties and then now we have you know, computers in our pocket, and now we have artificial intelligence. How has life insurance like changed over the years, and how has like uh, technology recreated um, how life insurance even works, or has it changed a lot, or is life insurance kind of still the same? It's just delivered in a different way. It has actually evolved over the years. Mm-hmm. So most people, you know, when it comes to life insurance, you get life insurance, you pass away, your beneficiaries get paid. That is still the case. It has not changed. However, now they have what we call living benefits. So what that means is if if a person is, um, has a critical illness, like they had a stroke, they had cancer, but they survived it. They have a chronic illness like kidney disease, emphysema, diabetes, COPD, or they have a terminal illness that they diagnosed. They have 12 months or less to live. You can actually activate the living benefits of your life insurance policy. So it's what we call accelerated death benefit rider. This is one of the riders that we can add to your policy. So if you have chronic, critical, or terminal illness, you can activate that portion of your life insurance where your life insurance company will now send you money for your claims, for your medical expenses and things like that. I have a situation where I'm actually an advocate of living benefits. And the reason why is seven years ago, when I started in the business, I made sure my whole family had life insurance. My 28 year old nephew just got diagnosed with chronic kidney disease at the age of 35. He will be on dialysis for the rest of his life until he's, you know, until they can find him a transplant. Mm -hmm. However, because he has the chronic portion of the living benefits, Now the life insurance company is going to be sending him a check from his life insurance policy every month for the rest of his life. Now it's going to decrease his life insurance, but he had over $300,000 in his life insurance. So it can be anywhere from right now they're waiting for the claim. It can be anywhere from $2,500 to $5,000 that they're going to be sending him. So that one thing, that's one way how, how it has evolved because we now have what we call living benefits. They've always had the cash values, but now we have the universal life where now it's not a set interest rate of one to 2% like a whole life. It's actually based on the stock market, not directly, indirectly. So you get can get credited more interest for your life insurance over the years for your cash values. So those are two ways that it's actually um, evolved over the years. You can use that saving bucket or that cash values for your retirement. Because the thing about life insurance, the cash values is tax free. You don't pay any taxes on it. When a person passes away, the policy is $500,000. The family gets $500,000. It's not taxable. If they had cash values of another $500,000, the family now gets a million dollars. Tax free money. So these are things that has evolved. When it comes to life insurance. Mm, so but when it comes to technology. Sorry, mm-hmm. go. My bad. Go ahead. So when it comes to technology, like you said, we have the AI and things like that. So the, you know, as life insurance evolved over the years, now, you know, we have infinite banking. People can use this as a investment. We have premium financing where the bank would pay your premiums for the first five years. You pay for the first five years. The next 10 years, you pay nothing, but you're still getting credited interest for the next 10 years. And you put no more premium 
in that policy. So technology has changed when it comes to life insurance, but you just need to make sure you're talking with the right person and they're giving you the right information. Gotcha. When it comes to the life, the, sorry, the living benefit, is that only done through universal life or can you, is that? Nope. Because that's the It's done through all oh, policies. Living benefit in any of them, huh? Yep. Or it's done through all policies. Living, um, term life, whole life, and universal life. Mm. Wow. That's why I say you have to make sure you talk with the right person because you do have some term policies that do not have living benefits. They just have a death benefit portion that gets paid out. So you want to make sure when you're talking about life insurance, you're talking with the right person. They're, make, they're doing a the research for you to make sure that you, that that person qualifies for, you know, all the portion of your life insurance. Gotcha. You know, we see these commercials on TV, nine ninety five. Um, basically, yeah, that's nine ninety five per unit. That unit is a thousand dollars. So yes, you can get life insurance for nine ninety five if you only want a thousand dollars worth of life insurance, which I don't even think that covers cremation. But so people have to be really conscious when it comes to life insurance. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know anything about the living benefits. That's that's why. And I guess it only you have to meet those certain requirements, right? Like you said, terminally ill. Or being yeah, diagnosed. terminal, right, mm -hmm. chronic and critical. So basically, the um, insurance company sends the paperwork to your doctor. Everything gets sent out. This is what my nephew is going through right now. It gets back to the, it gets sent back to the um, insurance company, and they determine what amount of the claim portion of that um, amount that they're going to be sending you monthly. Nice. And a lot of people don't realize that these policies have what we call living benefits. Because life insurance can be used while you're still living, not just when you pass away. Man, living benefits. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So, of the right, so you're saying, there's only three types. You have whole, term, and universal. Those are the three types of life insurance, right? Correct. Okay, and then your company life insurance is just group, group term it's life insurance. Group Term is group term insurance, correct? Mm -hmm. Got you. So group term, personal term, whole and universal living benefits. Man, this is some good information. This was great information. I'm learning a lot. Like, I really appreciate yeah. this because I've always bounced around. Like I don't understand the difference between all the life insurances. You broke it down very, like, very well. Yeah, broke it down very well. Definitely appreciate it. And I know that the people listening are also gonna really appreciate um, yes. all the gems that you drop. Uh, but I do also have to ask, um, so typically as we're, you know, ending the show and we wrap it up, what is one like vital piece of information? It could be like a phrase or a sentence. One thing that you could just leave the, the followers and the listeners um, in regards to life insurance and just your knowledge of life insurance. Well, I always tell people when it comes to life insurance, the living benefits are there, you know, if you need it while you're living. But the life insurance per se is not for you. It's for the family that you're going to be leaving behind. So you want to leave them in a situation where they can't replace you, but you don't want to leave them in a situation where if you're the breadwinner, you want to have some type of income. So I, I do understand when it comes to life insurance, you are not replaceable but why not have something in place? We always say for peace of mind for your family. So that that's what I would say, you know, have peace of mind for your families and know that you're leaving them in a situation where they won't have to struggle, you know, to figure out where that next dollar is coming from when it comes to life insurance. I, I like that a lot because, you know, um, I, I recently um, had, had someone pass my family and what people don't realize is, in that in that moment it's not just you're not just thinking about money people are grieving mm -hmm. and everything everything that's required of you during that time it's a lot and mm -hmm. it's not easy stuff and the thing another thing that i realize is a lot of people try to take advantage of people who are who mm -hmm. have just um had a death in a family like you get these people from from like prime like just, I mean, just a, a a lot of different um, 
organizations or businesses that that kind of mm-hmm. vulture on on it. it and it's kind of sad man but but yeah so i i feel like it is you know if you if you have those people that depend on you and those people around you it, it's very important as you said to not leave them with another problem on top of them grieving on uh, about your death so yeah, mm-hmm. I I really love I really love the message and and everything that you that you share with everybody. Can you tell everybody like where to find you, or how they can find you, um, Miss Cheryl? Well, actually, I do a webinar every Thursday, just pure financial information, and part of that financial information is protection, which is life insurance. Um, they can reach out to me via my email address. Um, they can text me okay. information, you know, what information that they need, but. Um, they can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm also on Alignable because my goal is it changed my life seven years ago. I want to be able to pay for it to let people know the importance of life insurance. Even if yes, you have ma'am. an investment, the importance of having life insurance. Like, like I said, if it's not for you, it's for your family. I'm going to I'm going to put the link to your LinkedIn in the uh, description mm-hmm. of this of this video so that if people want to. Um, you know, reach out to you and inquire about life insurance, they'll be able to. So it'll be on our That's YouTube awesome. and also it'll be on our, our Spotify and Apple podcast. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. much. This was very informative because like Deshaun uh, said, like it's one of those, there's a lot of intricacies to life mm-hmm. insurance. So, and you really broke that down in a very efficient way. You made it easy to understand. And I know that I, uh, you know, I, I know I had a lot of questions. I, I like to ask those hard questions too. And I appreciate, mm-hmm. I feel like you answered them very well. Um, and I know Deshaun was pleased with um, with everything you shared with us also. Absolutely. Well, thank yeah. you again. I appreciate your time for having me on this evening. Of course. Thank you, thank you Ms. Cheryl. Really appreciate it. As soon as this episode drops, we will let you know. Um, and just, again, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for taking the time out mm-hmm. and just, you know, given us this knowledge right um so we really appreciate it and thank you everyone who's listening we really appreciate your continued support and we will catch y'all next week